Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. And we turn in your hymnals now to page 986, 987 and following. We're treating the great Oscar Wilde's a small cutting from his play, The Importance of Being Earnest, one of the great works of satire in English and European literature. Hey, we're going to start on 986 at level 2A. When you bring up the work of Oscar Wilde, and you bring up especially the importance of being earnest, one of the first things that has to be said is that this is a work of satire. So we want to take a look on 986 and just see what we mean one more time when we talk about satire. Writing that exposes and makes fun of the foolishness and faults of an individual, an institution, a society, a situation. So write that down. That's huge. That's our definition. In other words, a simple shorthand definition of satire is making fun of something. Now, of course, in our freshman year, we're going to meet works like The Importance of Being Earnest. By our senior year, we'll meet works like uh, Alexander Pope's The Rape of the Lock or uh, Swift's Modest Proposal. And we'll come back to talk more about satire and different types of satire. Satire is going to originate from the great Roman writers of antiquity. And there were two great ones, a guy named Horace and a guy named Juvenal. So we have Horatian satire and Juvenilian satire. Horatian satire is kind of soft, gentle satire. You're making fun of your buddy and your buddy laughs along with you. That's Horatian satire. Juvenilian satire is mean, biting satire. Other people might laugh when you make fun of your buddy, but your buddy is not laughing, okay? Let's keep reading here. Notice we will say, although a satire may make readers laugh, it may also aim to correct the flaws that it criticizes. Some satires address serious social problems. Others explore less important subjects. Satirical writings vary in style and tone, level of subtlety, and the writer's attitude toward the subject and the audience. A satire usually has at least three things. They're bullet pointed. I hope you have them at 2B. One, can be gentle and sympathetic. That is to say, Horatian style satire. Or angry and bitter in tone. That is to say, Juvenilian satire. It may, too, use sarcasm or irony. That's a big one for our study, so write it down. Language that means the opposite of what it says. Our classic example of this that we often will give to seniors is the uh, young senior who is sitting there on the couch. She is texting with her friend, girlfriend, who is out on a date with a guy. And she texts as her mother is watching over her shoulder, unbeknownst to the mom. She texts, how's it going at the date? And the friend on the date texts back and says, greatest date I've ever been on. And the daughter texts back, okay, I'll see you in an hour if it's that bad. And the mother calls out her daughter and says, what are you talking about? Ma, you're not supposed to be reading my text. No, but I'm interested. Your, your, your friend just said it was the greatest date she'd ever been on, and you said I'll see you in an hour, which means it's a crummy date. What's going on? Well, here's the thing about satire. You can say one thing, or irony. You can say one thing, but actually mean something else. But here's the problem. How do you interpret it? The mother read the exact same words, greatest date I've ever been on, and thought, oh, how nice is that? Your friend is having a good time. You, of course, who know your friend, you understand the context, go, no, 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 no. She's speaking in irony. She's, this is satiric. She doesn't actually mean at all that it's a great date. She means it's the worst date she's ever been on. The obvious question for the mother is, well, how do you know that? The answer is, you have to understand the context of the situation. That's what makes satire sometimes so difficult to understand and read. And, no question, importance of being earnest received a certain critical evaluation because often people didn't completely appreciate this satiric quality, and that was true of most of Oscar Wilde's great work. Finally, number three, it may exaggerate faults, make them both funny and obvious. We actually saw some of this already in our study of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, a classic example of a times satire, especially the satire of falling in love. If you'll think about it, just pause for a moment, because we haven't really yet said this. Shakespeare is in some ways intentionally making fun in Midsummer Night's Dream of Romeo and Juliet, the very play that he wrote. In other words, it's almost like he's saying, can you believe how silly Romeo and Juliet are to end up taking their own lives? I mean, really? That is just crazy. He can make fun of a text 
of his own text, Romeo and Juliet, through a text like Midsummer Night's Dream. We're going to see similar kinds of things happen here. Now, we've mentioned Oscar Wilde a couple of times. Let's write down this information on page 987. You can see birth and death dates there, 1854 to 1900. It's an easy way to remember. Oscar Wilde dies right at the beginning of the 20th century. Educated in Dublin, in Ireland, and at Oxford University, where he became notorious for his wit. He was notorious for any number of other things as well. You can do your own research on that count. While he wrote poems and celebrated works of fiction, it was in his plays that Wilde's genius found his voice. The importance of being funny in a series of brilliant comedies, including A Woman of No Importance and An Ideal Husband, Wilde targeted the straight-laced manners and hypocrisy of English society in the, night, in the 1890s. His masterpiece, of course, Importance of Being Earnest, a drama about Victorian values that still entertains audiences today. And all I'm doing today is just introducing you to this play. I hope that you go and find a, a, a version of this play available to you on YouTube elsewhere um, and actually enjoy the entire play. Now, in this excerpt of The Importance of Being Earnest, um, I'm reading now on page 988, okay? From Act 1 of the play, the play takes place in England in the 1890s. You want to write that down at level 1. During the reign of Queen Victoria, a time when elegance, manners, social status were of great importance. In this scene, John Worthing, nicknamed Jack, visits the London apartment of his friend Algernon. Jack loves Algernon's cousin, Gwendolyn. In order to maintain his spotless reputation at his home in the country, Jack takes on a different identity when he is in the city. When he is out in the country, he pretends to have a brother named Ernest, and when he visits London, Jack pretends to be Ernest. Gwendolyn knows nothing about Jack's real name or his double identity. The only thing you want to write down right now at level one, you'll understand more about this when we get into the reading, is that we have a double identity game being played. Obviously, Shakespeare made this very famous, where you are the same person, but you go by two different names. And when you're with one set of people, you work with one name, Jack. And when you're with the other, you work with another, another name, Ernest. Okay. Now, in this excerpt, Jack finally gets a chance to propose to Gwendolyn. He is astounded that Gwendolyn loves him, thinking his first, thinking his name Ernest, and he begins his awkward proposal. Now, we also write this down, we'll have Lady Bracknell, who's going to interrupt. She's going to swing, send Gwendolyn out, and she's going to interview Jack. That is to say, she's going to, she's going to uh, make sure that she has some ability to um, find out who are you and are you a good guy or a bad guy, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay? Um, and, and then finally, her questions are going to satirize Victorian values and Jack's answers do not satisfy her kind of snobbish requirements. All right? All right, let's go to work now. I'm on page 989. Let's just enjoy this reading, at, again, at level one, and we'll come back to some of the conversation of what is satiric about this and, and whether we think it's juvenilian, biting satire, or more Horatian satire, kind of just gently making fun. All right, here we go. Read along, try and follow along. We'll enjoy a little bit of Oscar Wilde. From The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde. Charming day it has been, Miss Fairfax. Pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else, and that makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I'm never wrong. And I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I have often had to speak to her about. Uh, Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I have admired you more than any girl I have ever met since I met you. Yes, I am quite aware of the fact. And I often wish that in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. Jack looks at her in amazement. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines and has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence the moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, 
I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. Talk about 990. My own earnest. But you don't really mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. But your name is Ernest. Uh, yes, I, I know it is, but uh, supposing it was something else, uh, do you mean to say you couldn't love me then? Ah, uh, that is clearly a metaphysical speculation, and like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference at all to the actual facts of real life as we know them. Personally, darling, to speak quite candidly, I don't much care about the name Ernest. Um, I don't think the name suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has music of its own. It produces vibrations. Well, really, Gwendolyn, I must say that I think there are lots of other, much nicer names. I think Jack, for instance, a charming name. Right? Jack? No, there is very little music in the name Jack, if any at all, indeed. It does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than usually plain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for John, and I pity any woman who is married to a man called John. She would probably never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. The only really safe name is Ernest. Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. Uh, I mean, we must get married at once. There is no time to be lost. Married? Mr. Worthing? Oh, well, surely. You know that I love you, and you led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you were not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you, but you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject has not even been touched on. Well... 991. May I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable opportunity. And to spare you any possible disappointment, Mr. Worthing, I think it only fair to tell you, quite frankly beforehand, that I am fully determined to accept you. Gwendolyn. Yes, Mr. Worthing. What have you got to say to me? You know what I have got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it. Gwendolyn. Will you marry me? Goes on his knees. Of course I will, darling. How long you have been about it. I'm afraid you have had very little experience in how to propose. My own one. I have never loved anyone in the world but you. Yes, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does. All my girlfriends tell me so. What wonderfully blue eyes you have, Ernest. They are quite, quite blue. I hope you will always look at me just like that, especially when there are other people present. Enter Lady Bracknell. Mr. Worthing, rise, sir, from this semi-recumbent posture. It is most indecorous. Mama! He tries to rise. She restrains him. I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. Finished? What, may I ask? I am engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. They rise together. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I or your father, should his health permit him, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come on a young girl as a surprise, pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be. It is hardly a matter that she could be allowed to arrange for herself. And now, I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. While I'm making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolyn! 992. Gwendolyn goes to the door. She and Jack blow kisses to each other behind Lady Bracknell's back. Lady Bracknell looks vaguely about as if she could not understand what the noise was. Finally turns round. Gwendolyn, the carriage! Yes, Mama. Goes out, looking back at Jack. You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Sitting down, she looks in her pocket for notebook and pencil. Uh, uh, thank you, Lady Bracknell. Uh, I prefer standing. Pencil and notebook in hand. I feel bound to tell you 
that you are not down on my list of eligible young men, although I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I am quite ready to enter your name, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. How old are you? Twenty-nine. A very good age to be married at. I have always been of opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. What is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. Makes a note in her book. In land or in investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and the duties exacted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one a position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that can be said about land. I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it. About 1,500 acres, I believe, but I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only people who make anything out of it. A country house? How many bedrooms? Well, that point can be cleared up afterwards. You have a town house, I hope? A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, um, I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back whenever I like, at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, she goes about very little. Uh, she is a lady considerably advanced in years. Ah, nowadays, that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrave Square? 149. Shaking her head. The unfashionable side, I thought there was something. However, that could easily be altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. What are your politics? Well, I'm afraid I really have none. I am a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us, or come in the evening at any rate. Now to minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. Both? That seems like carelessness. Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce, or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I'm afraid I, I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I had lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was... well, I was found. Found? The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, uh, an old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing, because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Uh, Worthing is a place in Sussex. Uh, it is a seaside resort. Where did the charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket for this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. Oh. A handbag? Yes, Lady Bracknell. Now, I was in a handbag, a somewhat large black leather handbag with handles to it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James, or Thomas, card you, come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Uh, yes. 
The Brighton line. The line is immaterial, Mr. Worthing. I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you've just told me. To be born, or at any rate, bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion, has probably indeed been used for that purpose before now, but it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognized position in good society. M may I ask you then what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible, and to make a definite effort to produce, at any rate, one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. Well, I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. It is in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel. Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Lady Bracknell sweeps out in majestic indignation. Good morning. Algernon from the other room strikes up the wedding march. Jack looks perfectly furious and goes to the door. For goodness sake, don't play that ghastly tune, Algie. How idiotic you are. All right, let's turn now. I, again, my hope is that your inter